Hello and welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, November 10th. This is our community call. Um, so today, originally, the plan was to chat about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of future of SCURF, vision, objectives. Uh, we've just been having a number of discussions internally, so just wanted to have the community side of that discussion. Still very happy to have that discussion. Um, I just also wanted to, to leave some space around given all that's happening that's week this week between FTX and uh, you know Binance initially buying and then backing out and yada yada and you know I think yesterday I don't know if anyone was looking at uh, at the charts and whatnot but on Reddit there were uh, many people screaming WTF with massive bar charts of just red uh, you know I think Bitcoin dropped from like 21k to 16k very quickly um just due to kind of concerns around some of the FTX news breaking and while we're not interested in kind of focusing on markets and the prices directly, it is just indicative of like, hey, we've gone into a general bear market that, you know, things like Luna and some other uncertain activities kind of started pushing uh, the markets into, uh, or coincidentally timed with these kind of uh, economic uh, changes as well. And now we're at this point where, right, we just had this FTX thing. I'm sure if a month ago you, you sample people of like, you know, what do you think the odds of FTX going down anytime soon? Uh, not many people uh, would have said that's likely. Uh, and so how quickly that changed. Uh, and my own personal view is that we're probably going to have another one or two of these kinds of major player in this space uh, did something that is now scaring the daylights out of everyone or they're not as stable as everyone thought. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, there, there's going to be another kind of uh, intense dip and, you know, you get closer to the point where people are asking, like, is this the end of crypto or whatever? Um, so, yeah, if anyone does want to chat in that direction, <laughs> yeah, I know that's actually... One of the subs was talking about which uh, uh, there was a post which project is most likely to burn and crash next. And a lot of people came in with like, God, we'd love it to be crypto.com, but they actually stopped their things right in time to, to not just be uh, stupidly spending money in a time when you shouldn't. Uh, so uh, anyway, but yeah, if folks do want to talk about anything that's going on currently in the market, I'm going to pause there. If anyone does want to bring up, has questions around FTX, uh, I will, in case no one has seen it, I'm going to keep rambling until people either raise their hands or uh, or jump in. So yeah, Costa, I see you. You mentioning you have some questions. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not on that I'm on top of everything well enough to be able to uh, to kind of give a, a proper walkthrough on anything. But again, at, at the very least, just want to leave room for some of this conversation. Uh, and let me pull up that tweet from Lucas in case y'all didn't see it. Uh, but Lucas, who uh, helps create the uh, and uh, research pulse, I was going to say the news pulse, that's wrong, the research pulse here at SCURF, uh, who's also the head of research and development at Coinmetrics. Uh, he had a tweet around this um, that was quite influential and was possibly, yeah, I think he is the first person to talk about the Alameda thing and discover all of that. So uh, that was fascinating as well. I, I started reading this. I didn't get a chance to go down the full rabbit hole of uh, looking through all the details. But yeah, fascinating how they, they seem to have effectively did a bailout uh, in May, and some of that might have triggered what, why uh, some of this FTT was real. It was getting uh, realized and moved around recently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll pause for a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Pause for a moment there in case anyone does have anything. Has it? Yes, please, Yvonne. I just wanted to <clears throat> jump in before we go, go down to rabbit hole. Um, and remind everybody to watch our podcast. So the latest episode is up, and it is the second one in our mini series about block science with Kelsey Nabbit and David Sisson. And I will post the link in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Maybe we'll take a quick moment to pause there and give people a chance to think of things. So we forgot to do the typical let's plug stuff for what else is going on in the community. Uh, Paul, anything else on, on that that you wanted to mention? I mean, I know we got like super excited, like we just were going. Uh, so a couple things from kind of what's happening in the community side. Uh, first is tomorrow is the Source Cred Guild meeting at 4 p.m. Eastern time. If you are interested in the operation and disbursement of Source Cred, uh, please come to that meeting. You also see that that will be a reminder in Discord. Uh, there's an event tab in our Discord. Um, you can click interested on that. It'll give you a little push notification. Uh, so please come and chat with us about how source cred is running and, and all that type of stuff. Uh, the second thing, so exclusive 
to this meeting so far. Uh, we'll reinforce this in the chat and all that type of stuff. But related to uh, Yvonne's announcement of like the podcast next episode, uh, we're going to do another writing cohort. Uh, in partnership with Taptive, and that writing cohort is going to be focused on uh, the podcasts and the recaps there and kind of pulling even more value uh, out of those and engaging in interesting discussions about like the questions that those raise and what are potential answers. And uh, one thing that I would really like to see is uh, how can those um, opportunities or how do those questions potentially get uh, answered by some of the content that's already on uh, the forum and things like that. So doing some type of uh, cross posting, I think would be fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. Uh, you'll see more about this on Discord soon. Uh, and then obviously we'll be advertising it on our socials as well. But welcome to the value of attending a meeting or watching the recorded meeting because you get to hear about these things first. So hooray for being members of SCURF. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to always plug um, is some of the things that are happening on the forum itself. Uh, in particular, uh, there is the forum thread about claiming a citizenship bad, but also the beginning of a conversation about uh, what it means to be a citizen at SCURF and kind of what is that relationship uh, in both directions. Uh, that would be a great place for people to make some uh, contributions, especially if you are, are kind of hesitant to jump in on a research summary, uh, what it means to be a SCRF citizen, uh, maybe a little bit more accessible to everybody in this call. Um, and then also on top of that, uh, there is a really good thread that our friend James posted uh, with Spectral Finance um, and kind of an overview of what that project is and the goals that they're trying to um, achieve. And as part of our goal, of like, you know, how do we connect research and industry? I think this is a really great milestone that we kind of have some industry content on the forum. So it's a great opportunity to engage with that and see if the problems are trying to solve makes sense. So there's research that helps solve that. Um, are there uh, some assumptions that um, might be baked into what they're doing that we could question things like that. So great opportunities to engage on the forum as well as all the other good researchy stuff and ta-da spiel over. Yeah, and I will drop the link to the post that, that provides more color about the citizen badge. So if, if you're only hearing about the SCRF citizen badge for the first time, uh, please check out this post that Renee uh, put together. Uh, and yeah, Renee and Paul uh, and through and engaging and working on thinking this through. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, happy to, to take, well, first, let me just pause. Anyone have any other kind of uh, SCRF community updates for everyone? Next week's community call, we're going to have Chris from uh, Block Science Lab specifically talking about their smart papers uh, product and how it's just an interesting, uh, more interactable way to, to uh, display certain research findings and whatnot. So I'm excited for that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other things. Yeah, so uh, unless anyone does have any other ones, it sounds like not, we can jump into, yeah, just seeing if anyone does either want to check kind of FT, uh, FTX stuff that happened this week. Uh, if this is kind of making you realize like, hey, I heard a previous thing that happened, whether it was Luna or uh, I don't know, whatever project or, uh, you know, just any kind of general state of crypto and the world, uh, at least as it pertains to Web3. I don't know how broad we want to go into the state of the world, given the reality of the world these days. Um, but nonetheless, I just want to leave some time open in case folks do want to explore anything there. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll just jump to more of the, the mission vision, kind of updating on a little bit of, of that and having a discussion there. So I'll just say candidly that I, I have not spent much time reading through the FTX specific. So um, some baseline, please, if I'm misstating any of this, and uh, please correct me uh, so we, we could all do uh, use my lack of knowledge as a point of, uh, of collaborative learning. Um, from my understanding, right, like uh, some of these chains have developed their own tokens. So I don't know if anyone has seen like BNB with Binance or FTT for uh, FTX, but they create sort of a cryptocurrency, which I believe from my understanding, the logic of creating their separate chains and everything uh, is not just to have like a separate blockchain from their exchange business, but it's actually to give them more um, convenience, create more of the infrastructure that they want around and to make liquidity easier in their environment. 
supposedly. I personally still do not fully rationally get the logic of why exchanges need their own currency to operate uh, and why some of them have chosen to do it. I've read justifications. I, I just don't genuinely get it of like, why is this a better structure as opposed to having like a company that's an exchange that also decides to operate in L1. Um, so yeah, if, if there's any thoughts on that side, please feel free to uh, to jump in. And again, like I'm probably going to say at least one or many dumb things during this uh, this little point right now. So please feel free to call that out again, right? Like we're, we're all learning. The space is massive. You need to have so many disciplines in mind to be able to stay on top of everything, never feel intimidated uh, with just throwing out a question or a basic thought if you want to get the bull rolling with things. But yeah, Chris, please. So from my understanding, one of the benefits of having that structure is to supposedly be able to give people ownership into the operations and structure of that system concerning if it becomes a viable uh, protocol, then the people who have those tokens would have gained some sort of benefit or profit by investing in the infrastructure via tokens in, in the sense that like, when you ride a subway, a subway could be free, but they token they give you a token to give you access to that particular infrastructure so that say you have uh, subways and roads, if you use subways more than roads, uh, that person technically should be able to ensure that those subways have more capital to operate. So putting money into the token system, theoretically gives those uh, systems capital to be more liquid. And that's the theoretical framework, but often it ends up being a vehicle for arbitrage. So the way that it's meant to give power to the community is not necessarily how it operates, which is then why we get whales dominating the operations and the uh decision making within those entities and then it ends up becoming the ftx situation so that's where it's like in theory it's supposed to be one thing but in practice it tends to become this other as far as i can see yeah thank you for jumping in there and that's one of those where like yeah i've heard a lot about the governance side and supposedly right like let's cooperatively own a, a, an exchange like this and whatnot and um that one just either feels delusional or disingenuous in terms of like how it's actually playing out. Uh, like governance isn't working. Right? I was catching up with someone from a, a DAO tooling provider earlier this year who's been like been working on DAO since DAOs have been a thing uh, in Web3. And he's pretty much like, hey, the one thing that I think is the inarguable truth about DAOs is none of them work uh, yet, right? Like we're still figuring out how to make this whole thing operate. So it seems like the premise that, uh, hey, we haven't made this work and even tiny super bought in uh, non-scaled communities with no desire of becoming global, like let's just ha hand off the decision-making of a multi-billion dollar international company. Um, yeah, it, it's very interesting. Shapeshift personally is the one that I'm most interested with their decentralization push and attempt to kind of open up ownership and stuff along those lines, just because um, I feel like, A, they, were, they started pushing that earlier uh, and I do genuinely think like there it's driven more ideologically than financially, then how do you actually know at the end of the day? Um, but yeah, nonetheless, it's uh, sort of thinking of how how can we get more people participating in governance is literally a problem of just about every single governance structure. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, it's uh, I, I recognize that that's sort of a an idea, at least theoretically, uh, that that does sound great, and how to actually make it happen is a whole separate challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I, I was just hoping to, to fill some air to hopefully give some chance for folks to come up with their own ideas around this one. Again, if no one has anything around FTX or, or the state of crypto that you do want to chat about or ask about or anything, uh, we can just jump into the, the previously uh, scheduled programming of talking about SCRF mission, vision, objectives, all that fun stuff. I mean, I guess maybe as a, a kind of a hybrid segue, if I'm allowed to do that, is in these types of situations, right? Like, so um, what does SCURF do with this? 
type of event right that happens in the world right so we have mission and vision and uh like our mission and vision is not aligned with um ticker watching and price action well but these types of events certainly impact um and, and create opportunities for research or things like that so like where is where are kind of the brackish waters of where does Scurf interact with the actual world of crypto um, so that we don't just kind of become our own, like uh, like the worst stereotypes of the ivory tower of research of like we we're here to interact with the actual world uh, while also being dedicated uh, to a little bit more maybe on the research side of that actual world. Um, I mean, I think it's, um, yeah, so I guess there's a couple of elements there. And yeah, I would really love to, for folks to kind of jump in and mention, right, because there's the, right, the, the ticker keeping active analysis of the market, right? Like, that's not really us like, hey, here's breaking news and here's reporting. Like, that's not really us. Um, but sort of what are the, the kind of threads there? Um, and yeah, I posted to, to your point in chat, of course, these elements have implications on research and our forum and our community. And especially finding, you know, what is that balance of in a, in a theoretical non-resource constrained world, uh, like sure, we'd hire a hundred of the best, you know, researchers in the world and they'd all be doing primary research and analyzing the markets. And, you know, that's effectively like what the block is trying to do. And uh, like that, they're trying to be more of, hey, we're not just the news agency, we actually do our own analysis. Uh, Lucas, who does research policy, right? He's the head of R&D at Coinmetrics, different groups try to establish different ways of catching this information. Because interestingly enough, with this being a decentralized infrastructure versus a highly centralized one, um, and the highly centralized one, like there's very few pipes where all this information goes through. So if you want to keep a very a keen eye on what's going on, it's easier to do. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to think about uh, then like what happens in this more decentralized uh, infrastructure or even catching these potential issues uh, is challenging. Um, yeah, and there's definitely the clear financial application of smart contracts. Uh, I actually don't remember, because I think technically, though these things always have like an even earlier predecessor that is not recognized, but I believe Nick Sabo's 1994 essay is considered like one of the genesis points of using the term smart contract for like if then statementing uh, actions in like some kind of legal societal context. Um, I actually don't remember he, I, yeah, I haven't, I have to dig that article up. It, it's been a minute since I've looked at it. I don't remember which specific use cases he did and did not talk about. And close to, to your point of it not being legally binding yet. I mean, I know a lot of legal people in the web or no, but I've talked to some folks in the space uh, who come from a legal background and they're like, yeah, every term of smart contract is, is like, A, it's not smart. This isn't like some IOT enabled device that like continuously interacts and does stuff or whatever. And it's not a contract. These things are not legally binding measures recognized by jurisdictions around the world. These are just like uh, interpersonal, uh, legal, you know, code uh, committed uh, interpersonal commitments kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, if we got to do the redo on the branding of smart contracts, what would have been uh, the better term. Um, but yeah, to Paul's question or with anything that's come up before, would love to hear, uh, right, specifically around FTX. Um, we can potentially get Lucas to try to run another community call in the future, just the same way he did around the merge and share some of the research that he's actually doing there. Uh, right, if we see, uh, we can pull in other researchers as well to, to talk about this or, or who are keeping an eye on it. Uh, or are there other kind of angles of conversation, whether on the forum, in our community, in our live chat, and any other version that you would want to see? Yeah, Chris, please. Um. So there seems to be an opportunity in these types of events where somebody like Lucas has data to support his speculate, speculative theories, and he's also good at framing where the data stops and his speculation starts. Um, so if, if that if that kind of becomes a model for a conversation, then it really 
it's like the line between hard data and speculative theory like as the point of discussion rather than pure speculation because i think the problem is like <laughs> excuse me if people are invited to a conversation without data data points the, the, it can go theoretically anywhere um but when you have data points to guide the discussion then it really sort of limits the speculation and the theory to only the most logical things that can be correlated with the data that's presented so i do in the sense of like there are going to be especially with the blockchains having publicly available da data sets um or data that's in the form of a data lake to be turned into some sort of data set to extrapolate information uh that is a more constructive type of conversation than like pure speculation or like an ask me anything with no necessary direction um but they're also not necessarily going to be things that happen weekly either so like convening a special meeting that is this type of uh specialist data and analysis with also the open forum for q a i do think that's something that this space would particularly be interested in but it would also sort of make the conversation have rails and keep it limited but also give it some sort of like capacity to go into the places where it's like allowing researchers to speculate because i think a lot of them because of the nature of publications you don't really get a lot of capacity to speculate on the data within the publication itself so having some sort of open forum in which you can speculate but not also be held to this as like a long-term publication i think is something that's very novel right now but also something because of the nature of blockchains just having a ton of data available like it's i think it's really the time for data scientists to be centered in conversation yeah oh, please paul i was just gonna you know follow up on the idea of um you know this the speculation component so that's like within like would you want to see that speculation be in the form of this now becomes testable or this now opens up new um research needs or are you are you more thinking of it from a this is speculation of if i take all this kind of research together and um i'm using it to help interpret the reality that we're seeing um a little a and b um but i am interested in like how can we maybe take advantage of that speculator that thoughtful speculation because i think that there is some value there um without it becoming just like pure speculation if that makes sense yeah and that's the i think that's the difference between bringing data to the conversation versus just saying this is going to be the subject of our conversation um so for example um in in kelsey nabin's discussions like she always has data supporting why she's framing things about DAOs the way she is and it's not pure speculation um so it's like this is where like if you have on-chain data or um an incre uh, increase in volume in social media activity around a certain topic or uh mass liquidations or something that like is a point of quantifiable data that is the starting point for the discussion and why that data is relevant to the speculation and keeping it in that frame of like 
well, how does this relate? Like, if somebody makes a speculation, it's like, well, how does why does this relate to the data? How? What are, what are the connections that you're seeing to make that extrapolation? It it keeps it grounded and keeps it from straying too far in um, you know again theoretic a theoretical discussion can end up anywhere. Whereas if you continuously make the person relate it to a data point, then it's like uh, it only it only really allows the conversation to go in so many places. Yeah. Oh, please, constantly. Why to Chris? Why do you think it really validates the conversation that is ongoing, whatever that topic may be? It also. Oh, sorry. Costa, just jumping in and, and double checking. Am I the only one who's getting a weird feedback on, on Costa's audio? It's coming in like very choppy. Yeah, sorry, it's hard to tell. Maybe try reloading the browser and then and then hop back in. Um, yeah, I was excited to, to unfortunately hear your point. But yeah, it was coming in very robotic. Um, but yeah, until uh, hopefully Costa is able to get his mic sorted. That also just makes me think because. <clears throat> Right in the context of SCURF objectives, activities, projects, mission, vision, whatever angle we want to take it from, right? In a in a non-budget constrained world, right? Theoretically, right now, if heading into a bear market, uh, we had uh, just unconstrained budget, right? Theoretically, hiring a few researchers directly is an option. Um, but especially, and that was a challenge at the beginning, right? Because when we're in a bull time, the people who we want to hire to do these things are getting much higher offers from people in industry who are doing it, uh, and. Uh, it's actually very tough to find someone who's willing to dedicate the time more for that kind of open research angle. Um, but yet there are a ton of people doing this independent research. And so a thing that's on my mind is also how can we, as SCURF today, best start building relationships with the folks who are, you know, like having their technical analysis explode on Twitter uh, and being like, hey, do you want to have long form discussion for once this gets drowned out, given this is Twitter and you probably have like what, a 72 hour window for like the most active conversations? I, I don't actually know the data on like longevity of, of interaction there, but I'm, I'm sure they would not be opposed to having these uh, these kind of longer forms. So that's just a quick call to action of if you're coming across any Twitter profiles that you think consistently output really high quality analysis or really interesting viewpoints or anything like that, uh, please feel free to share that with the team uh, because I, I do really want to start keeping more track of folks like that and actually reaching out to them and asking them of like, hey, what value can Script provide? Because sure, you're not technically at acad in academia or working for you know a major crypto project, but you're a researcher, right? You're finding information, you're bringing insights to the space, you want people to learn and be better as a result. Uh, and so how do we help you out uh, from an infrastructure perspective as well? Um, but yeah, Costa, I see you jump back in, so yeah, please. So actually sure. that hits the nail on the spot because um, since I'm doing research for my own podcast, I mean, I, I could potentially use a lot of help as like what is, um, you know, the different topics that, I don't know, uh, I can't really say right now, but uh, I guess, providing some sort of data just publicly right just open data or being more open within uh, the the research that we are conducting within the forum i think that that's that gives visibility to to what's out here and what i can uh you know research for or you know conduct research within this forum i think that providing that type of information i think that that's just uh one aspect to the many ways that forum can serve as a service. Yeah, and that also makes me wonder, Chris, to your point um, of like, yeah, what are the other kinds of badges that can potentially be used to to uh, capture that kind of sentiment and interaction, right? Whether it's a uh, you know dedicated for a specific role type, or even like, hey, you're a, a really good research identifier. You're you're a, a research sleuth, right? Like you you comb through Twitter and find good research and uh, like whatever, right? We can even come up with some more fun socially uh, kind of named and branded versions around those. And uh, to the idea, or actually, I realized that that was in a, um, a different call, but the idea that came up was. Uh, the DSI Labs crew have uh, are working on a plugin, a discourse, uh, discourse forum based plugin to integrate with badges and non transferable NFTs. 
So then it's not constrained as a badge within our specific instance of discourse, but could be across. And there are some technical challenges that might preclude us from using a specific plugin. But at least theoretically, if it is possible, you know, can we get something like a, hey, this person is really good at surfacing a research badge and get that to be recognized by multiple ecosystems uh, who care about research and run forums and think about how we can also help generate uh, some of these um, functions for the space and capture them in some kind of meaningful way and hopefully at least add that non-financial incentive around like hey if you're finding cool research like please bring it to scurf like we will want to talk about it um and so yeah exactly and, and starting to recognize folks who are already at scurf and uh as well as outside of and, and kind of using that as its own way of building a community uh, of just folks who really love the research Yeah, so I don't know if any other ideas come to mind in terms of like what would be other like theoretically, right? If we did want to say take the angle of how do we uh, use badges to encourage folks uh, who are doing this kind of research to come, uh, you know, what what could be other uh, types of badges that we would want to issue, or are there just other ways that we could or should be thinking about how to work with kind of independent researchers uh, to capture more conversation around what's already happening? And you know, taking the FTX example is a specific one potentially. Yeah, please, Chris. So one of the things um, that benefited the grants program early on was to have people able to pick their uh, preference within the context of like subject matter. Um, so if somebody's just really good at like finding social media posts that from content in in the forum they shouldn't necessarily have to do anything else to actually be a really contributing member of the community so i think the more we're able to like recognize the parts of the community that aren't the forum posts but are necessary to have the community still exist, especially beyond the forum itself, um, then I'd like, because in the sense of building community, um, there's the community within the forum and then the friction between leaving and re-entering the forum to the outside community. And the less friction either way, the more people I think like stick around long term. Um, so that's where I'm always of the mind that like, especially now that like the discourse plugin is a potential viable option. It's like if s there's badging opportunities in places where it's like, yeah, I've I've made a ton of forum posts, and those I've gotten ba plenty of badges through discourse for that. But it's like. What about the people who've come in and commented a year later? It's like somebody who, for example, is able to like find uh, a conversation that's still relevant a year later. That's its own skill. I mean, and, 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 I, and I'm not trying to be too abstract. It's more so um, I'm recognizing in the sense of like building, trying to build the community and the culture. Um, it's recognizing that like it's there there are so many things that happen uh to that are necessary to build that sense of community that i think in the same way we weren't like um we weren't stingy about source cred i don't think we should be stingy about the types of badges uh in the sense of like not just like giving them out for in, not not just for like showing up necessarily but again um like again for for example just using gloria as an example i've seen the way that she can take information and synthesize it into new useful novel posts and that's its own skill so that like uh information synthesizer 
like whatever we end up calling it like that's a really good skill to have in this forum context so i think it's like that type of thing should be a badge it's kind of abstract but it's if we can be like uh or if we can find a, a quantifiable like okay gloria took three articles and connected or three forum posts linked those forum posts and tagged three authors that's like what this badge the like the lowest metric of somebody if you can find three articles and three people and tag them in a way that's like useful that is a specific i mean i'm trying not to be too specific with this example but again it's something in like observing the form behavior it's like how do we incur encourage people to do keep doing these things and it's like not being stingy with badges i think yeah that's interesting costa i saw you had your virtual hand up before did you want to jump in so yeah so i think that um one of the ways um to uh, rebuttal what uh, Chris just said, and to streamline. Uh, I think what he, what the object or the objective should be really is to um, to quote people, right? Like he said, to go through the conversations of of the reviews or even posts from the past, right, and see uh, what people made smart comments or or smart uh, reviews, right, and create. Um, a conversation or even a post surrounding those posts. And I think that that not only validates that one person, but it also opens up the conversation to new types of conversation or to receive new types of reviews. And so the badge that he's talking about is not just limited to one type of skill, but it really opens up the doors for everyone who is part of this community. And just by, you know, contributing to with the review. I think that that uh, would be a more inclusive way of um, of opening up this badge. I think that that's one of those ways. Absolutely, Paul, please. Yeah, in response to that, and also what Chris has been talking about, so a future state of moderation, for example, um, is uh, maybe a, a set of quests let's say that puts people on a path uh, to help highlight here are the types of skills that help move conversations forward here's the types of skills that uh, is necessary to um, <clears throat> synthesize stuff in a good way here's the type of skills uh, necessary to uh, be a good skeptic right and you can kind of put people on these various quest tasks there's a variety of badges associated with that um, if you have like these five badges um, all together, you get like a mega badge, like obviously just making up terms. Um, I don't think I would ever really want to call something a mega badge, uh, but you know, it's just a synthesizing or it's a kind of some um, milestone that one reaches uh, that unlocks more potential to do things, uh, more opportunities, uh, more responsibilities, things like that on the forum. So some of those types of things, like you can, we could build potentially these types of paths towards this type of behavior as well. If, if we kind of know the behavior that we'd like to see, to some extent, I think a, um, you know, if we can highlight the path that gets you there, as opposed to just like hoping people find it and then you get a badge if you do it. Um, I think is not only kind of something that we're talking about right here, but I think it's something um, that we are looking to develop, at least on like the moderation side, so that uh, it doesn't just have to be a dedicated team that is um, directed to go do a thing um, in order to see that type of content on the forum, but instead it's a thing that we uh, incentivize and lay out as a possibility and an arc for people um, as part of their engagement with um scurf overall and like apparently megatron is good that that's what it's going to be like that's just how it works we're going to create we the, the, com the composable skill badger badges that equal a transformer awesome um 
Yeah, and that also made me wonder, especially when thinking of not limiting it to sort of, uh, right, the goal of this is not to become known as like, oh, uh, we are this unique issuer of badges and these five people or 10 people or whatever do all the badge issue. Like the goal is not to think of it that way, but more to think of as is being discussed of how can we just create this landscape and interoperable with other places and uh, as representative of different things as possible. And another thing that came to mind um, is also, right, because given our the ultimate mission is research application to advance the space, right? So what would potentially an applied this badge need to be possible, right? So that's not something that like, we would be able to directly issue ourselves unless we know of what everyone who consumes the forum is doing. Uh, but theoretically, right, as we continue to build partnerships with industry, can we get uh, certain researchers uh, who are using the forum from different ecosystems and projects and whatnot to be interested to that if at some point it's possible for us to delegate to them of like, hey, you're, you're an industry researcher and by us giving you that role, you are now able to write uh, and apply this badge, which means that if you actually take anything from the forum, you could give a badge to that either comment or the full post or you know whatever, but like something in there to say like, hey, I actually did something with this stuff. Um, and yeah, and I, I do think like there's so much cool potential experimentation and thinking we can do about you know what will the next 12 months potentially hold for poten for various kinds of experiments we can do with badges. Uh, and it's also making me think that we should probably do a brainstorm on badging specifically to just see what are all the uh, come up with kind of just get a super long list uh, and then try to think of which ones uh, kind of are, are most feasible to actually experiment around in the near term. To that last point, I don't know if you want to you'd want to do that as a community call, but. Um with a little bit of lead time, I'd be happy to uh, lead that community call and we could do uh, here's what badging might look like because that has shown up a lot in conversations with the moderation team and the onboarding team. Um, so we could kind of lead where some of our, we could start with where some of our thinking is and then have a nice community brainstorm of like where else that could go. Yeah, that sounds great unless anyone in the community initially just finds uh wants to revolt against such an idea that seems super appropriate and would be great to get not just an internal team's input but yeah to make it more of an open discussion so yeah we'll do that in december we're going to have less community calls just with the holidays and everything so uh we'll have at least two or three i think uh so yeah we'll make sure to to get one of those as a kind of maybe we can frame it as sort of research badge brainstorming. Uh, uh, if only a research had a, a synonym with it, starting with the letter B so we could have a fun alliterative version. But some research badge brainstorming at some point in December. But yeah, Chris, please. So the reason I always lean on Raf Koster's theory of fun is that he recognizes that there's different types of community members concerning why people are here some people are here just to gather badges some people are here for the community some people are here just to explore uh and then some people are here just to get to the end or whatever they think is the final like if it's to post a forum post that's what they just want to do and complete that and they're completionists um recognizing the different types of participants and then also recognizing that badges eventually are going to get stale so if we can make it so that if like a person gets a certain number or certain type of badges then they get preference in um paid quests once the paid quests become opportune um i think that does create that arc where it's like you don't necessarily have to go through the badging process especially if somebody comes into the community and they're like oh i have a doctorate um, I want to do this for scurf, but I need to get paid. Well, that's fine. That person shouldn't necessarily have to go through the quests or the badging, but if somebody's coming in, no experience, but they go through the badge process and then start doing quests and also having the leveling process, then it's like, we're also creating this pathway to proficiency that's also graduated in a way that prevents people from taking on too much for their love for their level 
but also allows them to visibly and measurably move up in a way that gives them feedback to know that once they complete like and you get this number of badges and it's like oh now you actually qualify for level two quests and it's like it may be 50 badges before you qualify for level three but 10 badges to qualify for level two is like enough of a feedback difference where then 50 to get to level three isn't actually that bad because they know they made it to level two so adding that difficulty level is how you keep level three actually like it's not easy to get to level three but enough people get to it that the ones at level two see it's attainable um and it's like we can make it retroactive as well in the sense of we don't want people who i mean that this is not getting too far down the line but it's like if somebody if, if say we make a badge and it's like you have to do 50 things somebody who's been here and has been doing that thing in the community shouldn't have to start from zero in the sense that um yeah exactly so that's where i mean like uh the fun the the path to it's like i i'm i'm not against unpaid internships when they're used sparingly and efficiently and not ex exploitative in a way that it's like sometimes you need to just like prove that you can do something before you start getting paid and this is oftentimes in like junior research apprenticeships that's the way it looks like when i was working as a junior researcher i worked in a lab and i didn't get paid for it but the outcome was a publication that then made me on track to become a senior academic and senior researcher so it's like not to say that i shouldn't have been paid but it was totally worth it for me to help a senior researcher by doing the work that they need to get done to get published so then i could actually get on the path like that was way more valuable to me than like eight dollars an hour at the time so this is where if if somebody is going to help costa and and they get a badge for helping him do podcast research and eventually those badges accumulate to then the podcast is generating money and the people who helped him start generating money get paid first that's a, a model i think that allows people to understand that start sometimes you can start from nothing and go on a path to uh m being profitable but that doesn't mean you get paid at the very beginning but this badge is going to be how we comp like reward people in in this model and in general that also to that point thinking about you know if there's whether it's just skirt alone or thinking of the wider landscape of different organizations that uh you know that provide this kind of uh, education and training ground in various capacities and you could accumulate badges across them um yeah what, what does that look like then for for uh like hiring across the space and how do you like transition um yeah i mean it's it just making me wonder of like what are the environments that are most likely to uh use badge based resumes so to say versus traditional resumes and then uh what will the longer term entail of getting places that are still much more conservative and thinking in the traditional version like where, where do you actually start hybridizing it beyond just the you know web threes and DAOs using such tools to like when will a university or a corporation care that someone has one of these badges and what would actually need to happen at the system level uh for yeah for those to carry even not even at the same level uh right like for a a, a badge based thing to hold the same merit uh, as like a, you know, an MIT or an Oxford or an NUS degree is going to take a long time. Uh, but what are the kind of nuggets along the way that can just like help someone in, in, in their process of getting hired? Um, uh, that's funny. Yeah, I know that there are already, right, like Sammy, who's in our community, is working on a project called Etherscore, uh, where it's trying to effectively create like DeFi uh, credit scores, quote unquote. And I know Special Finance, which they wrote their innovation post, they're thinking of like these credit course score kind of models in certain capacities. So, yeah, it's interesting to, to think uh, where at least that, that data is being looked at versus where it's officially getting badged. Um, 
Yeah, that's just as a quick tangent that just reminds me of something that came up in a conversation uh, where someone who uh, I know who works at an accelerator was mentioning that they were working with VCs who started asking them like, oh, well, do you ask to see your ponzification scores and like tokenomic breakdowns from uh, from certain companies? And the person I was speaking to is like, ponzification, what? are you encouraging projects to be Ponzi's? That sounds like very bad incentives to put in place. But yeah, it's, you know, depending on what gets badged or incentivized, right, that could also drive very different kind of behavior. And that's where it got very scary of like, oh, there are companies literally asking you, how do you represent a Ponzi? And based on the more Ponzi F you are, we will give you more money. Uh, that would be scary. Um, yeah, that's another element to think about, uh, you know, how can groups that just have big pockets and want to drive in a more financially beneficial way, unfortunately, drive the system in a negative direction, but, uh, you know, potentially financially outcome in the process, uh, benefic benefit in the process. Excuse me. Anyway, I realize I meandered all over the place on that little ramble, but um, we're getting close to the end. Uh, so, yeah, I do want to make sure if anyone else wants to jump in and mention anything along these lines and hasn't had a chance to. Uh, that you feel free to now. So maybe not directly, or actually not directly related to this at all. Um, but I know that part of the lead up to this community call is we were um, we had advertised it a little bit as a opportunity to talk about missions and objectives and visions and things like that, which we somewhat touched on in this meeting, but not entirely. Um, but there is still opportunities for people to give feedback on that, because I think that is incredibly important for us at SCURF, for people to be thinking about the objectives and what we're trying to do. And like we've mentioned, the um, the financially constrained world that we currently live in. And so that means that those objectives become that much more important. So there is actually a thread on the forum from the last time that we talked about this that also has a recording associated with it and a little bit of a recap. So if you are looking for an opportunity to discuss those um, in more than the three minutes or the two minutes that we have in this call, um, that would be a really valuable place uh, to put that content as well. Um, it is also professionally my obligation to point out when there are things in the forum that I would like you to interact with. Yeah, thank you for mentioning, Paul. And I'll just quickly give an update on the community calls going forward, uh, just given uh, that we're getting close to the end of the year. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, next week, uh, and hopefully my screen will share momentarily, but yeah, next week we'll have Block Science Labs. The week after that is Thanksgiving in the US, so we will not be having a call that week. Um, then the week after that, tentatively, I think based off today, we'll try to shoot for a research badging brainstorm then, and we'll give an update. We still do have an open slot, so if anyone does want to see, hear from any specific project, hear about any specific research trends, uh, you know, hear from a specific researcher potentially, uh, please feel free to reach out to Paul and myself or Angel if you have any specific ideas. Uh, and then we will, I know today was supposed to be a vision follow-up and that kind of just went a little all over the place with where things are today. So we'll make sure that the last one before kind of taking some time off into the holidays uh, will be uh, will be on mission and vision. Um, so yeah, if you do have any ideas for, for what you want to hear, please let us know. Otherwise, uh, yeah, thank you all for joining and have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.